what are the different kinds of study design uh, how do we go about designing a study and then we go out in the breakout rooms the same ones there were and kind of uh, design a study for the questions that were identified okay so what are the types of research design so you have two experiments you have quasi experiments and you have observational research so two experiments are basically experiments very often is conducted in laboratory situations and it's more like you know you can control every variable you have a control you have a pre you have a post you know where and measurements are taken for your questions so um for something related to the social sciences things of true experiments can be uh, to study the uh, impact of conservation interventions for example say conservation education within a community so you can have like a pre uh, uh, intervention then you can have a post intervention you can have a control uh, where you have a community where the intervention has not been uh, implemented and this is one way of a true experiment basically where every variable can be controlled for and you're testing only for your hypothesis questions okay so in the case of a conservation intervention you're only testing to see whether it's effective or not so you try to control for as many factors as you can um, and for example also with uh, two experiments there's other ways you can do it is you can uh, subject certain uh, households to these interventions and certain households are not subject to these interventions and those are measured but of course there's also a lot of ethical things around two experiments because you're like is it very ethical to subject only certain households to benefits and certain households to not so there's a lot of that and the other thing is very often in social sciences we don't have that even uh, that level of control over experiments you know we don't we cannot have that level of control so this is a little bit unrealistic which brings us to quasi experiments so quasi experiments are similar to experiments but it's you know it's closely mim mim mimicking it when in because very often real world conditions don't uh, help us have these perfect experiments so, you know sometimes we might not be able to get baseline data before the intervention has started so we get uh, we get data after the intervention has started right so sometimes we can't subject certain households to things and certain households not to intervention so we do it for ho all households and then we see like you know what the effectiveness of these interventions are so very often uh, quasi experiments are what happen in uh, social research because we can't have has this level of degree of control uh, over these different variables that might influence uh, our research and finally you have observational research which is also what happens very often in this case it's not experimental so experiments are like you know you're testing something so experiments are if you're testing an intervention whether it's effective or not that's what i can actually think of uh, which is most common but with an observational research you're looking at case studies so often this is not just testing the intervention but you're looking at other aspects you know like what is the general um, maybe attitudes world views values um things like that so it comes in observation research so here we have case studies where you just go in depth into a single case study you have a comparative case study where you can compare like for example we were talking about eco tourism and uh, trophy hunting in this case you have two case studies one of trophy hunting and one of eco tourism and you compare each other you have cross sectional uh, observational design where you take an entire community and you, uh, you see across the because we had said communities are not homogenous but you see how it impacts across a uh, society so how does it impact on gender what are the impacts on like you know um say caste class or uh, different income brackets so you kind of take a cross sectional view and look at maybe perspectives or whatever your question is it's across a cross section and finally of course you have longitudinal which is measuring over time so this very often happens in health or even conservation education so health research you know you measure every one year the same people so after one year you measure then the next year then the year after that just to see or maybe every few months which is the same with education you know the impact of conservation education on the people so you measure them after one year then after two years after three years so that would be longitudinal design so these are the very uh, very quickly these are the types of research design while uh, designing a study that we want to do so there are experiments 
there are quasi experiments which often are most uh, practical because two experiments are hard to do in field but through experiments if possible where you can control all these different variables you will exactly be able to identify whether it's your intervention or whether it's not your intervention that's caused certain changes right so then of course uh, observational research so these are the types of research design so again based on the research design you choose there are met different kinds of methods in social science research like i had mentioned in this research in this uh, case uh, i mean in this uh, module we're going to be looking at standardized questionnaires and semi structured interviews more in depth but uh, these are all the different kinds of um, social science methods that are possible you know and this uh, moves from uh, decreasing standardization but it's to increasing flexibility right so standardized questionnaires means that it's more quantitative also and it's a uh, very uh, it's it lends itself to hardcore quantitative analysis right but as you work down this list towards participation observations that's not quantitative at all that's more qualitative right but that also gives you a lot more flexibility and it gives you a lot of changing you know uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility in what you can collect because standard questionnaires are prefixed right so it's the questionnaire is already pre prefixed so it doesn't give you much flexibility when it comes to um, collecting data because it's already fixed but it gives you it, this makes it more um, you know applicable to the larger uh, landscape perhaps depending on uh, you know how you decide to use it but it also um, you know gi gives you focused um, gives you focused questions a uh, focused results whereas participation observations is more loose and then in between of course you have semi structured interviews you have workshops you have focus group discussions and often it's mixed methods that people use you know you might want to start off with standardized questionnaires where you're collecting very fixed responses and then you might see something interesting and then you might want to go more in depth into something and collect qualitative information from say participant observations from maybe like few of those which you found interesting or it can go the other way where you start out with qualitative interviews uh, semi structured interviews to do a scoping study to identify what are the hardcore uh, you know how do you want to narrow it down and then move into standardized questionnaires so it's sometimes it's either this or that but very often it's a mix of these different kinds of methods that we use to land at uh, answering our question right so uh, the other thing that happens here of course is pilot studies which we'll cover more in the next sessions but piloting each of these are essential because that helps us understand what we want to do better and uh, you know fixes like especially with questionnaire semi structured questionnaires participant observations we also need to know whether these are the right methods for getting the data that we want you know because very often like for example with standardized questionnaires you might have like one fixed set of variables and you want to understand hunting right and when they people see the questionnaire they might just be lying to you and you realize oh wait this is i'm actually not getting the responses that i want which you might uh, realize that in these cases participant observations after spending a lot of time in the community might be one of the better ways of getting the responses that you want so piloting of these methods always really important right so once you uh, st uh, once you fix your uh, kind of experimental design whether you want it to be a true design quasi experiment or observational and many are observational you go into thinking of the kind of methods that you want to use and um sorry from this i want to little bit talk about validity which means like did so what does validity mean at the end of the day it means did you get to the truth using these methods and using the study design that you had were you able to get to the truth of the response so with external validity it means to what extent is it generalizable and with internal validity it means like have you been able to remove the confounding variables around answering a question an external validity or um, quantitative methods such as standardized questionnaires are often easier to get to external validity because it's more uh, you know applicable to the larger population with internal validity often qualitative methods go better because it help you go more in depth 
into something. So like for participant observations or even like qualitative interviews help you go more in depth and understand the situation better, right? So um, now coming to sampling, there's basically two kinds of sampling that you have. You either have probability sampling and you have non-probability sampling. So with probabilities, see, this is not very probably very different from what you've done with the uh, uh, with some of the other courses, but we can discuss uh, how it varies for the social sciences, right? So probability sampling is based on probability. So in, in very simple term, uh, it means that every what are the probability that something has to be picked. Oh, like a household, say what is your unit of measurement that you are thinking of, whether it's a household or whether it's an individual, whether it's a village, whether it's a community, right? So let's think of the level that you're thinking. Very often, it's either household level or uh, individual level that we look at. So then you pick random sampling, say, for example. So what random sampling says is that every, uh, say your unit of measurement is a person, it says every person has an equal probability of being picked. Okay, so that means there are 100 people and you just randomly pick up one. Uh, so whether you pick up, say, uh, Saloni or Justine, both of them have equal probability of being picked. So how does this translate into social research is, say we're going into, um, say we're going into measuring households at, in a village. And let's say we randomly, we're going to pick every fourth household when we enter a village. So that is going to be random, we're going to say, because we're going to be like, okay, every fourth household, they're going to be interviewing. Now, for example, let's say uh, a person is not there in the fourth household. Um, what do we do? Uh, please feel free to uh, answer in the chat. So say we want to pick, we're going to, uh, so ran with random sampling, we go to every fourth household, but some, and very often, I think uh, this is uh, one of the strongest sampling designs, but we also use this quite often in uh, field. So we go to every fourth household, but someone is not there in the fourth household. What do we do? You guys can either type it out or like, you know, put on your mic and share. Helena says return to return when they are back. Yeah. Aliana says if no time constraints could just try again later another day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But why would you not say sometimes when we go to the fourth household, we say, okay, they're not there. Let's just go to the fifth household or let's just go to the next household, which is the fourth household. Why do you think, uh, Helena, it's a very important point that you said we go back. Why do you think we have to go back? To them, uh, we wouldn't want skewed data. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Helena, that's a really important point. So the thing with random sampling is that if we don't, if we do, uh, if we don't go back to the fourth household, maybe we went at twelve o'clock during the day when everyone was at work. Right. And the only people, if we kept just going to the household, like fourth household and we missed them and we went to the fifth household and someone was there in the fifth household, it probably meant that they don't work. And maybe we'll be getting only people who don't work if we, you know, keep skipping that. But on the other hand, we have, if we go back to them, we ensure that we don't skew the data in this way. Right. So the other issues that can potentially happen with a uh, random sampling by randomly picking, say, every fifth household or every uh, 6,000, it could be if there is a design that by chance happened to be mimicking what you have picked. For example, if every street has only six houses and you have picked every sixth house and the sixth household has the biggest house, right? Because it's the biggest plot, because it's a corner plot or something like that. And maybe they're the riches that and by chance with your bad luck, you manage to pick that household that can also bring in uh, a kind of bias to your uh, sampling. Of course, another way of doing it is just to randomly throw in all the houses, house numbers into a random number generator and just pick houses at random, like see what the random number generator throws up and go to those houses. And like Helena and uh, Aliana are saying, make sure that that house is the one that you sample by going back, right? But what if people don't answer? 
like what if they don't want to answer that can also bring in a kind of bias because maybe they don't want to answer for a reason maybe it's a sensitive maybe the ones who are not answering are more sensitive to this and the ones who are answering are less sensitive to the question that we are asking so that kind of bias can also come in right so um then of course from random sampling we have stratified random sampling which again you stratify society according to to make sure that you get across all uh, sections of society that you want to uh, measure so let's say you want to stratify according to gender or you stratify according to class caste you know these different kinds of social uh, uh, classifications and then you randomly sample a, sam a sample within each strata and the same things that we talked about random sampling applies that we make sure that we go back to the same households that we identified if they don't uh, if they say no we go to the next household but we also sub, uh, we also from the ran random number generator pick other households to replace the household that don't doesn't respond right and then be cognizant that why are they not responding maybe that could also lead to certain bias in data collection then from or probability sampling we have non probability sampling so probability sampling is also very similar for ecological design right non probability sampling is haphazard sampling is also similar in ecological design basically go wherever you want so that's the same thing in social sciences as well like you walk in and any person that you see you kind of go up to them and you're like okay let's have a chat can i ask you questions and that actually is one of the weakest designs because it's subject to a lot of bias as you can imagine right you go where people are available you go if people have time you know and depending on the time of the day you go in people might be available so that there's chances of a lot of bias creeping in then there's of course volunteer sampling so volunteer sampling is when uh, people uh, like at malls <laughs> and you're standing there people are coming in and you're just asking them would you like to fill in this sheet if you would like to give in your responses please fill this in so that's volunteer sampling where people voluntarily give you uh, fill in questionnaires or fill in data it can also happen if you uh, go into a village and tell people you know i'm here if and i'm interested in looking at say trophy hunting and eco tourism if anyone is interested in sharing your views and talking to me about it please come to me so that can also be volunteer sampling uh actually while i'm talking and while i'm finishing maybe we can give examples in the chat box or even on youtube mic of uh, where these sampling designs might be useful like on the what condition uh when you think what we can use volunteer sampling you know uh then we come to targeted sampling so targeted sampling is this is targeted sampling is when you are sampling a particular group okay your group of interest so if you want to say if you're looking at uh, uh say tourism eco tourism and hunting versus hunting uh, versus trophy hunting maybe in this uh, sample we just want to target all the households that have eco tourism programs in them and maybe we want to just target all the households that have trophy hunting programs in them so then we go talk to them maybe there we want to look at hunters right hunt not not just trophy hunters any hunters in a situation why do they hunt what are their motivations for hunting what joys does hunting bring them so then we want to just go and target the people who are hunting right so what do they hunt why do they hunt where do they hunt all those questions we just uh, target the hunters maybe we want we're interested in things to do with livestock herding we target only the people who are herding livestock right so that's targeted then of course finally you have mobile sampling where when you go ask someone a question you can ask them do you know someone else who would be useful you know like maybe you want to ask like uh, saloni's research one of her research questions she was looking at uh, you know uh, stories of uh, like you know local stories from a landscape uh, that were related to wildlife so then she'd go to the older people and then after she'd ask them questions she'd be like okay do you know someone else who knows about this in your village or do you know someone else who i can talk to about this and they refer you to someone else so like a snowball it gets bigger and bigger so that's also snowball sampling so each of these have Advantages, 
disadvantages and it really depends on your research question and you know what you're trying to get at that you uh, use one of these because um can you give examples like for example uh, very often they say random sampling is one of the strongest study designs right because um and when it comes to probability and non probability the thing with probability sampling is that it is you can um extrapolate it to the larger landscape right because it's based on probability you are saying uh, say 30 people that you have uh, uh, spoken to that can be uh, you know expanded to the larger population and this is what the patterns are from your data the patterns that are throwing up this is also extrapolatable to the larger population but when it comes to non probability sampling it's not extrapolatable so what you find out from volunteer sampling target sampling snowball sampling that is applicable only to your data and you can't extrapolate from that right and very often with non probability sampling it's qualitative methods that we're going to be using right so um yeah so with probability you can extrapolate with non probability you can't extrapolate from your data but both have their uses right because it can give you in like uh, targeted snowball one you can probably give you more in depth information about a certain group which random sampling might not like if you just want to find out about say hunters and there might be like two hunters in a village and there are 100 people and if you do random sampling very easily you'll miss the hunters and you won't get any information in case you might just want to do targeted sampling where you target only the hunters so you know you're making best use of your resources and time so any questions i just wanted to add that maybe one example of volunteer sampling is online surveys or uh, yeah. mail surveys yeah that's also volunteer sampling you send yes. people uh, emails and you ask them to fill in if you have time yeah and of course each of these have biases you know and it again depends it's important to think of the bias that can creep in like with volunteer sampling say with online surveys you're sending it out to people maybe people who are online the most are going to be answering that maybe people who have the most amount of time are going to be answering that you know so it's important to think of the biases that can keep creep in also uh, using our sampling design cool um okay so then of course sample size and this is a very um this is a question that uh <laughs> is very hard to actually answer right because so what is the right sample size that we want to get at so how do we arrive at sample sizes and deciding sample sizes so if we're looking at qualitative data basically why do we need a good sample size right what is our sample size going to tell us so when it comes to qualitative data we want to make sure that there is an accurate we want to make sure that there is an accurate understanding of an issue that we as researchers have an accurate understanding of an issue when it comes to quantitative data we want to make sure that what the, the patterns that we are observing are because of patterns that are emerging and not because of chance okay so uh, that's the thing of sample size because at the end of the day we want to make sure that whoever we've sampled and whatever we've sampled has gotten us clo as close to the truth as possible so if we're looking at qualitative and we what we're trying to understand is accurate understanding of an issue uh, one of the ways people determine whether they have enough or not is through um, saturation this thing called saturation so basically after asking questions if they feel that you know additional information is not giving more additional uh, um samples or additional interviews are not giving any more new information that point is called saturation right so um for example if you're asking about um you know what are the different kinds of uh, uh, benefits that trophy hunting brings to a village and you go into these uh, you go ask people that and after like say the 10th interview it's the same benefits that are coming that point is called saturation so the way to go about that is with qualitative data especially it's important that once you start data collection to keep going back to it so after like say the fourth or the fifth interview sixth interview keep going back to your data 
and looking at it and seeing if it's repeating or not how much of new information you're getting and of course every interview is going to give you some level of new information and it's up to you to decide at one point whether that new information is going to be worth the amount of new information you get is going to be worth the effort of collecting more uh, data then when it comes to quantitative here we're looking at chance versus patterns right you just have to make sure that the data that you have is is real and it's because of actual patterns you're observing in the data you're collecting so uh, this i think a lot of it is probably already covered in the other section so uh, quickly one thing is like looking at mathematical uh, using mathematics to look at this so for example if you're looking at 95% confidence intervals and there are um, there are uh, things online that help you uh, calculate the you know the sample size like uh, uh, programs online so you can say you want to fix it for 95% confidence interval and uh, with a which means that you have a 5% confidence level right so using that so if you have like a sample size you have a population of 7 uh, million or something let's say in london if you want to see what their uh, uh, you know what they feel about zoos in london and you know uh, yeah the attitudes towards zoos you can fix a confidence interval for 95% with a confidence level of 5% and see the sample size that throws up so in this case it might be like 400 sample or uh, which is the sample that you need to uh, determine with a 5% or 95% confidence um, uh, interval that this is applicable to the rest of the population right uh, and if you have a smaller sample if you have a smaller population so say like less than 5000 people you might want to increase your confidence level to about 99% right so you want to say for 90 99% with confidence that you have what you are sampling is a uh, representative of majority of the population so you run this uh, the numbers again and you can get say um, you know you get, the numbers are higher then so say with like 5000 people you get um, uh, you know you might get like uh, uh, 500 that's important so one way is to use the mathematical way of determining sample sizes before you start out and on it is Kranji, sorry i think you're breaking up a little oh okay uh just the last three sentences now? yeah yeah so so there are uh, uh, when we come back from the breakup group i'll show you because <laughs> i when we come back from the breakup group i'll show you the online software that we can use to determine sample sizes right with certain uh, confidence uh, interval and confidence level the other uh, thing that you can use uh, the other way of determining sample sizes for quantitative uh, uh, interviews is also looking for quantitative data collection is also looking at um is looking at what other studies have shown right so what have other studies shown how many uh, what were the kind of sample sizes that they have used and fixing your sample sizes based on that but uh, ultimately at the end of the day what we are um, working towards is making sure that we have uh, patterns that we can say for sure are from our data and not versus chance so pilot studies can be very inf- uh, important in fixing some of these you know because you can also understand your population better you can understand the kind of variation in the population you can understand the differences that might occur across the board and finally of course what we had covered a little bit earlier non responsiveness because when it comes to some uh, non responsiveness some people might not want to answer some households might be not answering so like we had said this can lead to bias and one uh, so while doing this we it's very important that we note who is not responsive and we substitute it by uh, making the sample size say 30% larger than what was predict uh, what we uh, anal- uh, what we had said we do so that it makes up for non responsiveness within the data right so i think what we can do now is again go into the breakout session before we go in i think we can stop a little bit and um, 
if there are any questions, if there are any clar clarifications, if this went too fast, we can discuss this a little bit more. But um, what we can do then in the breakout groups is uh, ha design, have a research design, a method, and a sampling design for the question that you identified. And after you come back, we can go more in depth in the session. Excuse me, Ranjini. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, could you please just explain a bit more about the differences between random sampling and um, haphazard sampling? Because I'm not sure if I understood really well that what are the, the, the true differences. I feel okay. that both are a bit kind of random and yeah. you just accidentally find uh, people and ask your questions. So could you just yeah. please explain it? Yeah, thank you so much, Nilifa. That's a very important question. And thank you for asking me to clarify that. So random sampling is before you go into a space, right? You have, so random sampling is de, uh, based on probability. Okay, so what we're saying is every household or every person has an equal probability of being fixed, of being picked to uh, have a question. So what this means is beforehand, we decide before we go into a village, you decide, say, su supposing there are 100 households in a village, I decide that I'm going to go and question every fifth household. Okay, so I go out and I uh, stop and I question every fifth household. So there is a pattern to the way I'm questioning. So every fifth household, I've randomly picked. Or I can say there are 100 households, I put it into a random number generator either an R or online, and I ask them to, or even put it in a hat, right? Like I cut out, uh, I say 100, uh, 1 to 100, cut out papers, and I put it into a hat, and I pick out names, right? So then I get numbers like a 8, that are uh, 20, that are 80. And I go out and interview only these numbers, right? So this is a random design which means that every household has an equal probability of being picked, which means that, uh, so then I'll talk about haphazard sampling and I'll say the difference between the two. Okay, now with haphazard sampling, what happens is that I'm going into a village and I start interviewing the first person I see. And this, this is a woman by, the, uh, by a well picking water and I'm going at 12 o'clock and I go up to her and I ask her like, you know, and I start interviewing her. After I interview her, I look around and I say, okay, there's another household. Uh, the guy is out, the man is outside. I can go interview him. So I go to him, right? Then I look around and I see a bunch of people under a tree. I go to them and I ask them. So this is haphazard sampling because, and this is different from random sampling because now everyone in the house, in that village doesn't have an equal probability of being picked. I am picking people based on their availability. Okay, so it's very biased. So I am picking people based on, first of all, what time I've gone, because I might have gone at 12 o'clock and only people who don't have a job are only people who are unemployed are in the village. So the only people I've, uh, I, have uh, I have interviewed are people who are unemployed or only the people who have been outside their house. Okay, or only like older people which is not a strong design because it biases my data a lot, right? Or I might have gone and, you know, sometimes uh, areas are segregated, like uh, areas are segregated according to class, areas can be segregated according to caste. And I might not know this beforehand. So I might just go into a village in a certain area and I'll start interviewing only people whoever I see in that area. And that area might be only where the rich people are staying. So that is also extremely biased because I'm just interviewing whoever I see, right? But with random sampling, I have taken, I have decided beforehand who I'm going to interview and whoever I have chosen I, I has not been chosen based on whether they're available when I went or not. But they have been chosen beforehand by an equal probability of being fixed. Am I clear? Is that clear, Nilifa? It's very, very clear. Thank you so much, Ranjini. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great explanation. Thank you, Nilipa. Okay, thank you. Oh my God, it's already 3.30. Wow, <laughs> did not see the time. Okay, um, 
it does anyone else have any questions sorry this is going to go a little bit over so maybe we have like a 10 minute breakout session and then we can uh, you know uh, discuss this but i'd like to discuss any questions anyone has runt yeah instead of breakouts i was wondering yeah. if we could just do an open 10 minute kind of discussion okay yeah 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 it's better uh, saloni maybe we can do that because we don't we we really run out of time so perhaps what we could do is uh, people uh, people have already stated their uh, research aims right but not the objectives yeah so maybe we yeah. can go group wise and uh, you know state that first and then we can talk a little bit about uh, you know the second half and if people have questions about it and stuff and we can yeah. kind of continue uh, in the next session if needed yeah sure that sounds good saloni okay so uh, should i call out the breakout room leader yeah okay so adnan in the first breakout room would you like to elaborate on the research question that you picked and what are the objectives within that adnan or anyone else da- daniel uh, daniel took that up okay so uh, yeah i think okay. yeah we decided to okay okay adnan do you want to continue or shall i just elaborate it Okay, so I'm going to uh, continue. Yeah, our question was, uh, what are the trophy hunting impacts uh, in a certain region in Pakistan? And uh, we discussed the, the we actually uh, yeah discussed about the our objectives and aims, and uh, also uh, we break out the question into two parts. Uh, the first part uh, to actually assess the socioecology. of the trophy hunting by assessing the attitudes and wildlife uh, value orientations and uh, this type of research and uh can you hear me yes yes okay. very well daniel yes okay okay thanks uh, and uh, yeah the second part uh, also to actually investigate the economic economic uh, uh actually uh, yeah the economic uh, position of people toward uh, the economic incentives let's say yeah of uh, people and are they even are they in favor of trophy hunting or not and how are the actually monetary incentives of uh, trophy hunting for them and uh, we actually uh, gone a little uh, out of time so uh, we didn't discuss uh, aim and objectives thoroughly but our aim was uh, something general as you said uh, as it should be so uh, the socio ecology of trophy hunting and for objectives to assess the attitude wildlife value orientation and an economic investigation and uh, about the research design i would say that we should go for a random sampling uh, but an a stratified random sampling perhaps among the people uh, in that region which are directly impacted by trophy hunting uh, for example not the people in that city in a developed city near the protected area the rural people yeah uh, so it would be a stratified random sampling i would say and uh, uh, what else mm-hmm. what else should i just uh, discuss am i missing something that's fine we can come back to you late your group later perhaps we can move on okay sorry for no no that is no 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 this is sharing uh, daniel that great you're welcome yeah so i just uh, very quickly uh, so with stratified random if you ta- you're going to be targeting only the people impacted by this right so just a food for thought do you think that would be stratified random sampling or would you want it to be a uh, targeted sampling we can come back okay or even it's for the group in general we can all pipe in so group 2 iftikhar or others whoever wants to speak 
Uh, yeah, I can go through what we did. We didn't get to the breakdown per se. Um, so our question was to analyze impact of trophy hunting on Markor, of Markor on the economy and livelihood of local communities in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, so what we reviewed was that in some places it's illegal, some are controlled and some are game reserve areas. Um, and that trophy hunting impacted a lot um, for the Markor there was some could get 80,000 to 100,000 from an outfitter where, and I, I think I got this right in taking notes, 80% could go to the community, 20% went to the government. Someone correct me on the team. Um, okay. And so the community receives the quota and then the government manages that quota and distributes it to the communities. So it's good for the community in ways where it helps for development purposes, increasing livelihood and supporting infrastructure projects such as bridges there. Um, and we wanted to also, so look at the community, we wanted to also be looking at the households individually, but some specific households, um, communities uh, sometimes distribute the funds and how that um, goes for community development. Uh, so for our question, I think it was inductive, um, but we didn't get into the breakout of objectives for research. Great, thanks so much, Helena. And maybe with the group, we can discuss what are the methods that we can use to answer that question. So yeah, why is it why is it inductive research? Why would you uh, use an inductive research to answer this question, and why not deductive? I think we we had no um, theory that we were putting forth. It was more gathering of information to see and to analyze. If the car says that uh, stratified ram random sampling with semi-structured interviews would be a good idea for that kind of a question. Uh, why stratified random sampling? Helena says targeted sampling. Okay. And if the car also adds pilot surveys would be an important role would play an important role. Yeah, pilot surveys for anything is super important. It's also important for, for testing your questionnaires, which we'll come to. Okay, shall I move on to breakout three and then yeah. we can review? Yeah. Oh, uh, Jennifer, Jen? Jen or Muhammad, whoever wants to go. Mohammed, do you want to go? Jennifer, go ahead. I will. I will just say that uh, we just changed our question, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, in front of the group. So I feel that uh, we haven't even had a chance to discuss uh, this question. Um, so I think, uh, and we also didn't have a lot of time on the other question. We had some internet problems. So I feel like maybe it's best if we move to the next group, unless Muhammad, you wanted to say anything about this new question uh, that about what is the distribution of economic benefits in the community that you just uh, thought would be a great question. If you remember, we had sort of uh, come up with a at the last minute, a genetics question. So we just changed it to one that Muhammad said, there hasn't maybe been a lot of uh, look into. We also, Helena had the trophy hunting, Muhammad had given us a background that there was 80% of the uh, economics, uh, of the economic benefit went to the community and 20% to the government. Um, but he was just at the end saying that actually maybe there hasn't been an assessment of this and what and how that's being distributed mm -hmm. so that it might be interesting to look at the distribution 
of the uh, economic benefits within the community, uh, which I think is very interesting. Um, so that's as far as we've gotten. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great, Jen. Thanks. And also sorry from our side because <laughs> clearly I've not managed the time very well. But uh, hopefully for the next uh, session, we can we be better with time management. Uh, maybe the last group, if we can have their question. Guys, you want me to go on the other far? Xiang Ying? Yeah, sure, Yana, go ahead. Okay. Um, so our question was uh, impacts of trophy hunting on community perspectives towards wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of broke it down. We wanted to know um, if the community is benefiting from the hunting um, and if that's the whole community or a proportion or none and kind of see where the money is going. And then beyond that, what the attitudes of the community are towards conservation. So um, what were the historical perspectives before hunting um, versus perspectives now after hunting is implemented? How did those perspectives change? Um, do local people prefer specific species due to hunting demand? Um, or do they, they like species more, certain species more than others? Um, and then kind of moving that into how did views on different species shift if they did and how they did? So, for example, um, like before hunting, people were kind of ambivalent towards carnivores, but now after hunting, they are, let's say they're hunting for large ungulates. And so now people are angry at the carnivores for eating the large ungulates that bring money into the community. So something along those lines, kind of like competition between the hunters and wild predators. Yeah. Um, and then also, how does managing for the hunted species align with conservation goals, or does it at all? Um, so I guess we kind of decided it would be more inductive than deductive, because mm -hmm. we don't really have a, a, an opinion. It's just okay, kind of going in with these questions to see yeah. where it leads us. Yeah. Um, and then we didn't really get to aims and objectives. We yeah. <laughs> got booted. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, and then uh, Nilofar and Xiang Ying, I'm just going to kind of say my ideas on research design. And if you want to jump in and add, just. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Adriana. Great. Okay. Uh, so just kind of thinking, it would be interesting. I came up with three different options for the research design. Uh, two were quasi-experimental and one was observational. Mm -hmm. Most likely the m best or the easiest to do would be observational, one location with hunting and just go in and talk to people. Um, but it'd be interesting if you had two locations that were very similar with ecosystems, livelihood, government oversight, and one had hunting and one did not and compare them. Mm -hmm. Or if you had a long time period and you could go into one community before hunting, implement hunting, and then go back later to see how things change. But yeah. that takes a long time. That would be a long, a long study. Yeah. Um, so kind of going with just the observational one location with hunting. And I thought it would be kind of a combination of standardized questionnaires or, and then structured interviews and observation of participants, kind of do a mush of all three. Yeah. Um, and then sampling would be a combination, again, of random or stratified random for the most part for the general questions about perspectives and income from hunting, but then also combined with some targeted and snowball sampling for the historical perspectives, kind of like target the older generations to see what they thought before hunting was implemented. Um, and then the management goals of the government versus the conservation groups. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aliana. That was really uh, comprehensive. And yeah, I, I think you're excited. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Thank you. And I think you did a really good job um, describing how we can actually use multiple methods and multiple study designs to answer our questions, you know, like, and it's also been broken down. And each objective might require a different study design, might require mixed methods. And a, a combination of these can actually lead to stronger understanding of the system right great so thanks so much uh, everybody 
Um, I just had a I few think... points to add, mm-hmm. if I may. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing was, uh, you know, it's really great that uh, you've used a mixed methods approach. And sometimes actually that works best, like Ranjali said. Uh, but, uh, you know, also maybe think about, which we'll cover in the next session, uh, about how you would analyze data or how you would be able to compare data or combine data from these different methods. Would you need to combine it? Would you keep it separate? Just, you know, just think about it. Uh, the other thing that happens when you're looking at like temporal stuff, like, you know, before and after, uh, memory is known to be imperfect. And there is always this idea of the golden past and, you know, everything was amazing in the past. So that is a trap sometimes people might fall into inadvertently. Uh, and that is something to be sort of mindful of. So one way to, uh, you know, counter that is to have some sort of a triangulation. See if you can, you know, uh, maybe look at some records, some historical records or archival data that can back what they are saying or, you know, something like that. Any kind of records or, you know, speaking to multiple people to get like like a, a multi perspective on the issue, you know. So these are just some of the things one could do. Uh, to make sure that there is rigor in whatever data we are collecting. Because social science, unfortunately, especially qualitative science, is often criticized for not being rigorous enough and highly biased. So if there is a way to uh, minimize the bias, that would actually work in our favor when we do the research. So that's all. Great. Thanks, Sal. Very important points uh, you've brought up. And I'm sorry that firstly it went over time. <laughs> Secondly, there was not enough time for you guys to discuss, but uh, hopefully we can uh, fix that in the next session. And if you guys have any questions, any doubts, any clarifications, please feel free to write in and on the chat as well. And I'm happy to uh, go through this and we will share some of the extra material when it comes, because I think in some of the previous, in the previous session, some of the feedback got was that people would like a little bit more theory of social sciences. And because we're not really going so much into depth. Yes, Jen, this will be available as a recording. And if, um, because we weren't able to go so much uh, into the theory. So we can share, uh, you know, some of the theory of social sciences as an additional folder, which you guys can access whenever you feel like.